Hi, everybody. It's Pam. Hi, Pam. Here. Hi, Joe. Oh, hi, Jerry. Hi, hi Jerry. <laughs> hi, Pam. How's everybody doing? We're good. Oh, God. Good. I am here tonight. I'm Pam. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Pam Police. I am the director of the documentary about Dick Biondi, and it's being produced by my uh, production company, Real Stories Productions. We've been in production for six years, and we're hoping to finish this year. And if anybody's interested in more information, you can go to dickbiondifilm.com. So I am here tonight with Joe Farina, my co-host, and a very special guest. And I'm going to let Joe introduce Jerry. There you go, Joe. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Pam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's really a, a thrill and an honor for uh, Pamela and I and to introduce uh, legendary talented uh, musician uh, from the shadows of night and hp lovecraft uh, everybody please welcome jerry mcgeorge jerry thank you so much for joining us tonight oh it's great it's my pleasure <laughs> yeah thank you jerry what a, we didn't get a chance to finish our conversation last night we had a very brief conversation there were some technical di difficulties so um let me ask you how did you first come to become, you know, become a musician? How your love of music it, it appears started early on. Is that right? Well, it, it really did. You know, it's like fourth grade with the tonette, you know, the things that they used to do when they had music in school, you know. And uh, my dad was a big band trumpeter, and he hated the music business. He was a preacher's kid, and this is how he worked his way through college. He went to well, what, what is now Carnegie Mellon University, to get an engineering degree. And um, he went straight from being, you know, like a, a deacon in a church to playing in big bands in New York. And, his, you know, his mind could not absorb some of the things around him, which we don't have to go into. But anyway, he was dead set, none of, it, one, none of his kids to ever get involved in music. And we got musical talent from our grandmother who was a very, very talented lady, wonderful lady. And uh, anyway, so he said, uh, you know, got done with this. And actually the band director says, oh, you know, the kid's got talent and he wants to play the clarinet. We used to hear like Benny Goodman and stuff at home. And dad said, no, you're going to need braces. You can't play horn. Oh, okay. So then along, you know, a couple of years later, Elvis comes along and I wanted to play guitar. And now, you know, you got to learn how to play piano first. And piano and me are like the oil and water. We're just not going to mix. Not at that age anyway, uh, unfortunately, because it's a good thing to know how to do. So anyway, it wasn't until I was 15 and my best buddy in high school, Eddie Hendricks, um, got a guitar. His dad bought him, you know, like just a little plywood, you know, harmony guitar or something like that. And I thought, well, this is cool as it can be. And I bugged my mom. Um, you know, Eddie got a guitar. I want to get a guitar so we can, you know, play guitar together. And uh, so anyway, we got a little K arch top and, uh, you know, started taking lessons at uh, Foster Music of Woodmar in Hammond, <clears throat> in Hammond, Indiana, in uh, 1961. And, you know, I had an affinity for it and things moved on. And uh, unfortunately, I had something my mother called the curse of too many, too many interests. And so, you know, I, I wanted to do that, but I wanted to be a professional bowler and I wanted to build hot rods and I liked hanging out in the sports car dealership down the road, you know, and, and all this. And, uh, well, I was also into bowling, you know, cause it's Northwest Indiana. What else do you do but bowl? Um, so anyway, it, I it had to share, you know, time with five or six other equally, you know, hip interests. So, um, First influence, I think I would say, you know, aside from like rock, you know, and Scotty Moore and uh, James Burton with, uh, you know, Elvis and Ricky Nelson, um, my teacher introduced me to Chet Atkins, and he was my first guitar influence. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought was very fortunate because you learned what great tone was, impeccable playing and stuff, whether you like, you know, country or other kind of schmaltzy stuff that he played a lot of times was a good first influence. Mm -hmm. And then I got into, believe it or not, um, this was the early 60s, bossa nova artists like Lorindo Almeida. Charlie mm -hmm. Bird was a big favorite back then. 
Um, and again, focused on tone and harmony and, and things of that nature. And things tended to happen over the next couple of years where I didn't play guitar that much. And uh, what happened was the Beatles. And the Beatles had girls. And I got invited to play with a band. It was a band from Munster, Indiana called The Mystics. Four great guys. And uh, we uh, actually, for, you know, high school kids, uh, I, was the old, you know, I was the old man in the band. I was 17 or 18, I guess it was. And uh, we actually, we weren't too bad. And, uh, and then things just kind of went from there. I started playing with Jeff Boyan in the Blackstones. And uh, we played quite a bit around Chicago. Played at the Whiskey and places like that where we, you know, developed some chops and, you know, kind of honed, mm -hmm. kind of figured out what it would be like to be a professional, you know, playing clubs and things. And it kind of went from there. Yeah. Awesome. How did you, how did you end up uh, joining the Shadows of Night? How did that happen? Well, in late 65, um, two of our members, Dave uh, Blanchard and uh, Tom Osborne got drafted right at the same time, our drummer and bass player. And we worked out some other guys and we had been, this, this is kind of what happens when, you, when you're young, you know, and you're with your buddies in a band, they're your buddies. And whether they're the best at what they do didn't really matter back then, it was that they're your buddies. And there's something very important about that, you know, when, you, when you're doing a band, you can get, you know, the best musicians in the world together. If they don't like one another and they can't share ideas, they're not going to be very good. Right. Um, so anyway, the tough thing, this is trying to like replace family members. And we just couldn't find guys that we, f that we felt were going to work. Um, and along about that time, Norm Gotch, uh, the Shadows rhythm player, got drafted as well. And they were doing the demo sessions for Gloria at uh, Universal Studios. And Joe Kelly invited me to come up. He said, why don't you come up? Just sit and, you know, we're going to do the, the sessions and things. And out of the blue, uh, you know, when they wrapped up, Joe said, listen, we're going to need a, another guitar player. Are you interested? And, well, yeah, I'm interested. You know, I really like the, you know, like the guys. I like the stuff that they played. So it didn't take me long to say yes. And so I just kind of, you know, met with Jeff and said, listen, you know, I got a really good offer here. I'm going to have to take it. Um, and that was kind of like kind of my entree. And it was, it was November, maybe Thanksgiving time, 65. Okay. And, and so Joe and I, uh, I had never li lived outside the house. You know, I lived at home with my wonderful mom who kept a, you know, wonderful house, did the laundry, cooked the food, you know, got the place cleaned up because I certainly wasn't going to do it. And Joe came from a similar background. So we moved into an apartment in uh, okay. Rolling Meadows. And uh, it was across from a Nike base, which is, it was a missile system that we had. You know, they were going to defend us from the Russians. You know, they're going to have all these missiles across the street, you know, that we're going to shoot these bombers down. And because whole thing was ridiculous you know but it was the 60s right the things that our government spent money on anyway um well we were probably not the most welcome people in the apartment complex because we like to party a lot you know and we like to invite the girls over and stay late you know things and uh there were some interesting things that went on and uh, there was mostly military guys that lived in the in this base and so it was really not a good fit you know they were pretty happy when we left but anyway uh what we did, the place would get to the point where even Joe and I couldn't stand it. It was so dirty. So what we would do is we'd ride into Arlington Heights and we'd go to like McDonald's, which was known as Max. And uh, we'd ride around and say, hey, uh, you know, we got some beer. You want to come over, you know? Well, and we'd get like you know, a couple of girls to come over. And the place was such a pigsty, they couldn't stand it. So they cleaned it up for us. <laughs> well, the unfortunate thing is that this got around, you know, so we pretty soon, you know, we couldn't pull that one anymore. And uh, anyway, we were there for a little over a year. It was just known as the apartment. <laughs> and uh, that was pretty PG compared to things that could have happened. But yeah, there you go. So, so uh, Jerry, tell the story about the Shadows of Night big hit, Gloria, how that came to be. Okay, well, they, had, they were playing the band in 65 before I joined. And as the story goes, um, our producers, Bill Trout and uh, George Badonsky, they had this kind of vision of Dunwich Records. And they needed somebody to kind of get the thing started. They'd done a couple of small things with, you know, a couple 
you know, folk acts and things, but they, they had an idea that they could hit big with this song. Clark Weber had told, I think, I think it was Bill, Clark Weber had said, if somebody would change the lyrics to that song, we can get it airplay, but we who, just can't. Done just by, who, who, it was who, done who, by them, by Van, written by Van Morrison and done by them. And it had been a minor hit in different parts of the country, um, California, Southern California, uh, South Florida, but it couldn't get general airplay because it was considered, this is ridiculous in this day and age, but it was considered that the original lyrics, she comes into my room, um, was unacceptable, you know, for the gentle ears of, you know, 60s youth. So we changed the lyric, I think Jimmy changed the lyric to, she call out my name or somebody did. And that's what we did on the record. Fortunately for us, we beat a number of other bands to the punch, oh. partly because of Bill, um, Bill and George. George was a uh, promo man for Atlantic. And so uh, George had a lot of contacts. And so we got pretty good early airplay with this, the tune. It was well recorded. It's a really good version of the tune. Um, Tom is particularly spectacular on it with a drum roll at the end. And, uh, it, you know, it is what it is. It stood the test of time. And, and we're really proud of it. Um, if you told me in 1966 that we'd be talking about this in the year 2020, I don't think we'd have believed you. We and wouldn't have even conceived of 2020. The fact that it was just nominated into the, what? The Rock and Roll? Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Our version. And uh, I know that's a little controversial, folks, because they think, well, the original version should have been, you know, enshrined in the Rock Hall. Well, you know, go pound sand. You know, it was our version that was the hit. And as I like to say, we had the hit and Van got the money. We bought him an island or two, I think, and several mansions on the royalties off of Gloria. The story was that... Uh, we were told early on that he was furious with, with, with Atlantic Records and with us and everybody that we stole his song and everything until he got a couple of royalty checks. And then we were his brothers from another mother. You know? And so he's, and Jimmy has had, had some encounters with him. I'll let, I'll let Jimmy tell you about him. But anyway, uh, okay. he considers it our song now. Joe, your turn. <laughs> That's pretty ama that's pretty amazing story because Gloria and and, and Shadow Knights probably uh, if I could say this is probably the greatest garage rock band of, of of all time and if you go back and listen to the catalog of music it's just absolutely spectacular and during that time you were with the Shadows Jerry there there are, I was just curious because there are so many other uh, Chicago area bands too starting to make uh, m you know make their name uh, as well. I was wondering if you could just kind of talk about uh, the atmosphere, the camaraderie between uh, the Shadows and the Crying Shames, NC, you know, New County Six, a lot of those Chicago area bands. What was yeah, that it, it was uh, really camaraderie like? It was a really interesting time. Uh, very creative. Um, Naturally, you know, we're just working off of a narrow set of influences. It was mostly the British bands. And uh, very sadly, like for us, because we, we thought of ourselves as a blues band, we're echoing back tunes from English bands that were recorded by African-American artists that were 15 miles from where I grew up. And I never heard any of this music when I was a kid. Um, you know, it was, I guess they called it race music or whatever. I could have found it if I'd gone far enough over on the dial on, on the, on AM, you know, that's where it lived. Um, I didn't know anything about it. You know, we were focused on WLS, WCFL and uh, you know, the rock stations, we wouldn't call it rock then, um, pop, popular music stations. So anyway, um, the, the narrower set of influences, you know, the British bands were pretty much setting the tone if stylistically, um, what was expected in terms of vocals and things of that nature. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's the first British invasion, which is the Beatles and the Stones. Um, I'm thinking of the Hollies. Uh, give me a couple, Joe. Um, who else can we throw in there? Well, them, um, some others. And Dave Clark Five, that's the one I was thinking mm -hmm. of. And, um, then there's the second wave, which I call, I call music 
BC and AC, before Clapton and after Clapton. Um, so you get to, to six, late 66, early 67, when the second wave of British bands are like, really, you know, trios, Jimmy in 67 and everything, that's when the whole world changed. So you've got that kind of compressed time frame between 65 and 60, late 66, early 67, where you, you're still getting that, that kind of first wave of British bands influence. Um, and that influenced all of us and dictated a lot of what we recorded. Sounds um, not as adult as music that came later. We weren't singing about we were doing drugs and um, you know, a lot of social issues and everything. It was mostly boy girl type stuff. The car stuff was done by 1964. Done by 1964. The Beach Boys, that Beach Boys stuff. Um, so, you know, that was kind of our influences. We, we rub shoulders with all, you know, Crying Shames, uh, Ides of March, um, Jim, and uh, those guys were still in high school, I think, the first time we heard them. And uh, amazing, you know, amazing success they had later. And we kind of knew all the guys, uh, Pete Cetera, Jim Donlinger, a lot of guys that were uh, in the club scene at the time, the adult club scene, not teen clubs like we played. And uh, thinking back on it, just you know, the number of amazing musicians that came out of Chicago in that period of time, you know, over a period of about 10, 10, 15 years. Um, I remember um, going to San Francisco with H.P. Lovecraft. It uh, was really the first time um, the Shadows, we only played in, in California once, um, unfortunately. Um, so we got booked to play the Fillmore Auditorium in uh, fall of 67 and then we, we, we had two gigs two weeks apart and it inspired everybody let's move back and Mike Tegzik said to me after we'd been around the scene in California at Long he says you know the only difference between California and Chicago is that they get the hype he said there's not a band out here that's as good as most of the bar bands in Chicago and they never get the exposure. Poor Mike Bloomfield had the audacity to tell the truth to Rolling Stone, and it really hurt his career. Oh, wow. But he basically trashed the San Francisco music scene. Um, and he just said, you know, there aren't really a lot of good musicians here. He said the best one he could think of was Jack Cassidy with the, the Jefferson Airplane. And he, he said kind of the same thing. And unfortunately, if you knew Mike, which I knew, you know, a little, um, Mike liked to talk a lot and it got him in a lot of trouble, but he did speak the truth to a, for a lot of people that just wow. said, you know, what are you talking about? I mean, yeah. yeah, it's a scene, but we do much better music back home. In back home. So anyway, um, yeah, it's kind of the impression we had no, we had no reason to hang our heads. You know, the difference was we just didn't have the big, the big hype and the big scene that they had, you know, out on the West coast in the late sixties. Oh, okay. That was a big jump. I just went from 65 to... Yeah, you did. Joe, are you... Magic. You got your audio but, working okay? Joe? Does it me come yeah, down? Can you guys hear and see me okay? Yeah, yeah I now you. I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Got gotcha. So okay, much. sorry, guys. Uh, Jerry, uh, you know, how, did, how did you... Uh, the Shadows of Night and to HP... Lovecraft, because you went from basically like a garage blues type of band to really kind of a folk psychedelic uh, uh, band. Tell us yeah. about how you made that transition and how you got uh, into the band, how you got into H.P. Lovecraft. It, it's an interesting story. We had, well, it is to me. <laughs> um, we had, uh, we were worked to death. Um, and Tom, Finally, in spring of 67, Tom Shafford had enough. Um, I've said before, I would look at, over at him every once in a while in some of these gigs, and he I looked like he was going to drop. The poor guy was just exhausted. Wow. And, you know, the way they booked us, and it, it, it probably wasn't that unusual for, for, a lot of other, uh, for a lot of other bands. We, they, we just worked and worked and worked and worked. Um, and we might get a couple days off you know, it, it, out every 60 days. And usually that was just refitting to go back out on the road, another string of these things. And we started getting stale. 
we started making mistakes. Um, Warren uh, Warren didn't want to continue with the band. So in it was November, December of 66, Warren, uh, Warren, we kind of had a dispute and Warren quit. So we replaced him with Hawk Walensky, which was a good ad, you know, because Hawk, amazingly talented guy. Mm. And Tom continued till the next spring, and we were going to do a tour of the South. And this is a time of civil rights, you know, lots of the same stuff going on now. Um, Tom was afraid of it, and because we were, we're traveling down there with no security, with Illinois license plates and things, and he was scared to death, frankly, and he was exhausted, so he quit. And we tried to replace him, and we found a, a really kind of neat story. There was a little high school kid uh, at Arlington Heights that idolized the band, idolized Tom, and he knew all of Tom's legs. And so we took him on the road, um, on a little tour down to Atlanta and, and places, and came back. And he really couldn't continue with us. And we were struggling to find a replacement. Joe was having an awful lot of problem, personal problems at the time. And it looked like he was going to leave. So one of my old friends from the Chicago music scene was Barry Oakley, who became the bass player with the Allman Brothers later on. And Barry had played with a, in a band with the guy we were using as a drummer, Tom Morris. And it looked like Joe was going to leave. And Tom said, you know, Barry is a really good guitar player and he's going to come through Chicago. Why don't we talk to him? He might want to join us. He was playing bass with Tommy Rowe, with Tommy Rowe's band, the Roman. And so the night that the Who played at the cellar, uh, Barry came to hear them and to meet, you know, really just with me. And he had this beautiful black Rickenbacker bass that he didn't want to leave in his rental car, his rental van out in front of the, the cellar. He was afraid it was going to get stolen. And I said, well, just give it to me and I'll put it back in the dressing room. You know, it, it's, it's secure back there. So he went out to hear in one of the bands, it was before the Who played, and H.P. Lovecraft was one of the support bands. And uh, I knew George Edwards through Jeff Boyan from, you know, a couple of years before. And while I'm talking to him, I said, wait, hang on a second. I want to look at this bass, the, the Barry's bass. So I opened it up. I get the bass out and I'm sitting just kind of plunking on it, talking to George and George blurts out, gee, Jerry, we'd love for you to join our band. What? You know, kind of, oh, hello. So I was dating a girl at the time, you know, and she kind of hears all of this and we get, you know, at the end of the concert, which was amazing. Um, at the end of this whole thing, you know, we're all buzzing and everything like shit. And she goes, are you going to do this deal with them? And I said, I don't know how I could not do it. You know, I mean, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're kind of up and coming and this is a really good. So I thought about it for a couple of days because I really didn't want to leave Jimmy in the lurch, but I couldn't not do it. You know, it was just one of those things that happened. So that started it. And uh, in the end, it wasn't a good fit for either them or for me. Um, they really needed a stronger singer than me. Um, I can't sing and play at the same time, you know, still can't. And I'm not embarrassed because B.B. King couldn't either. Which was one of the reasons why B.B. always had to, while he was singing, he didn't play at the same time. He just played a little lick or two. Okay. Um, but uh, I couldn't, literally cannot play a line. I don't have the independence to be able to sing at the same time. So this wasn't going to work with, you know, a vocal band like that. And I was also kind of at a point in time where I was probably needed to go home and eat mom's cooking. Um, <laughs> I was, we weren't making any money, you know, and I was probably on the verge of malnutrition at the time or something at the time. From, we, went to, we went to New York in, when was this? was the winter of 67 to play at a club in the village. And I was so broke, I couldn't afford to go out to eat. You know, I got to get oh, something. Boy. So I went, I went to Balducci's and I bought a pepperoni and I got some Toll House crackers and I, I, I literally for like three or four days, I lived on this pepperoni, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I couldn't keep it in the room because somebody was going to find it and they were going to eat it. So I wrapped it up in a towel and I put it outside the window on this ledge outside the window in this hotel, which was like off Washington Square. And uh, the pigeons started eating. You know, I came back and there's a peck holes in the bloody thing, you know, eating my pepperoni. Oh, my but anyway, this is kind of, this kind of where I was. So. Anyway, we moved to California in 
March of 67, and it's not something I wanted to do. I had a dear girlfriend at the time, still the love of my life, and I was going to have to break up with her. Yeah. Um, she wasn't going to come with me. And I knew that this is not, this is not going to work. And actually, they, had, they at the time had been working out a couple of other guys. And uh, so after about a month out there, yeah, I got fired, and they replaced me with Jeff, who should have been in the band, Jeff Boyan, who should have been in the band from the beginning. And uh, I went home and ate mom's cooking for about six months and practiced guitar down in the basement. And uh, then just kind of just kind of worked. I was really, I became like a guitar student at that point in time. And uh, that's kind of what I am now. You know, I just kind of study guitar. Uh, I, I really didn't ever want to get back out on the road and do things like that. And I, my dream was really to be a studio musician. And uh, that's kind of what drove me to get a, I got a music degree from North Texas about 10 years later. Um, went right. to Berkeley the next year, and, but my folks didn't have the financial, that's a pretty expensive private school. Yeah. Berkeley School of Music in Boston, not in California. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, then from that point, you know, I got married and things got slowed down and whatever. And my wife's family moved to New Mexico and uh, she wanted to be close to her family. So we picked up everything and moved from Northwest Indiana to the wilds of Southwest New Mexico. And it was as though we were transported on a, on a, a, a saucer and landed in a completely different world that I just fell in love with. I love living. Well, that's awesome. You know what? I'm going to have to end it there because we're running out of time. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, man. Oh. You know, I, <laughs> this is really great. fun. It's, so, it, it's great agree. to hear those stories, you know, and really you, you took us right back there. I love it. I, can I show off my uh, Thank shirt? You. Yeah. Okay. This is sure. one of our dear sure. One of our dear old friends is Nancy Leviska, who was one of our fans. Uh, she was from Palatine and hung out at the cellar. And she is now, um, uh, her son is Red Foo, the rapper. Uh, Stephen Gordy, uh, his, his father's uh, Barry Gordy. Anyway, she, uh, Nancy is uh, Ice Cube's administrative director. And Ice Cube did these t-shirts uh, and collected all his money to donate to um, first responders and uh, healthcare workers. And uh, so it was a $40 donation. I think you can still get them. And it says, check yourself. And on the back side, I don't think I can do this where you can see it, but it says, before you wreck yourself. Oh. It means wear your mask and shut up about it. Just wear your mask and don't make <laughs> it. Where can you get one of those? <laughs> Uh, you can get it uh, from uh, Ice Cube's website and uh, look on there, and it's uh, there's, I think it was forty bucks or something like that. Money well spent. Nice. Awesome. It's a cool shirt. That's a, that's very, very good. Nice. Jerry, this is great. Thank awesome. you so much for doing this. Love really talking to you guys. It. And yeah, Mel, thanks for always being there. You're always yeah. so great. Um, Did you get a hold of Jimmy? Thank, thank you. You too. Thank you. Let me just sign off, Jerry, and I'll be right okay. with you. Thanks, okay. everybody, for, for watching and for joining okay. us tonight. It's been a lot of fun, and we love you, and we hope everybody's safe and uh, enjoying this beautiful weather, even though it turned a little cool here tonight. But it's pretty cool. It's great. We love hey, summer. We got a thunderstorm about to start out here, too. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, anyway, Take good care, night, everybody. everybody. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.